Hey guys, Nick here. So today I just want to walk you through a post-processing workflow that I used in Lightroom on a recent image which I took in Denmark. So here's a before and an after of that image. So this image is a, a good example of the typical tools and tricks that I would use in my post-processing workflow, that's why I picked this one. One important comment to make before we get into this though is uh, regarding JPEG versus RAW file formats. So a lot of the information you'll see online really recommends shooting in RAW all the time. And while that does have some advantages, it's not completely wrong to shoot in JPEG. Now, this image was taken with a DJI Spark drone and it doesn't have a RAW shooting format. So you have to shoot in JPEG. So I've sort of forced down that route anyway here. However, RAW does have certain advantages. Uh, the main one being that it's um, it's in particular in the highlights uh, and the shadows, it has all of the image information, all of the raw image data, far more than JPEG has. JPEG is a compressed file format, so what's happening with, with your camera, when it takes all of the raw data from the sensor, it creates a JPEG by compressing the file and basically removing some of the data, deleting some of the data, and you just lose it, you can't recover it. And that's in particular in the shadows and the highlights, important where in RAW, you might still be able to recover some of those. In JPEG, you can't. If they're blown, if the highlights are blown out, then they're just gone. You can't recover them. So in a scene where you have a high dynamic range and you have highlights or shadows which are which are blown out, then I would recommend shooting in RAW. Or if you're shooting for a, a customer or a client and you just want to be sure that you get everything, that you can recover everything, if there's something that you've you've missed, you don't see in the, on the on the preview screen on your camera. Then you can shoot in RAW, you can even shoot in RAW and JPEG if, if, you're, if you're not sure. The advantage of JPEG is that you save significant amounts of disk space. Now in this example, like I said, I shot with a DJI Spark drone, which doesn't have a RAW shooting mode, so I was forced to shoot JPEG. However, I do shoot often in JPEG when I'm doing an image which is just for myself, it, it's not being sold, it's not for a customer or client, and the dynamic range isn't massive. So I can do one exposure and I can get all of the shadows and all of the highlights in one. A JPEG like that, you can still actually do quite a lot of editing, post-processing in Lightroom and achieve different effects without needing the raw image. So I just wanted to say that JPEG is not, a, sometimes you'll hear or read that JPEG is, you should never shoot in JPEG. I don't believe that's true. I do shoot a lot in JPEG. So if you like my images, then there you go. That's proof that you can shoot in JPEG um, and you don't always have to shoot in RAW. In this specific example, if I just go back to the, to the before image, so this is the, the RAW image. It's, it's not a RAW, as I said, it's JPEG from the drone, but it's the, the JPEG that I got from the drone. You can see that there are some highlights in the sky, uh, in particular the cloud on the left in, in the sky there, um, which is actually blown out a little bit. So if you go to the Develop tab in Lightroom, and you just go to this uh, show highlight clipping, this triangle in histogram, it highlights, if I click on it, it highlights the image uh, area which is blown out. And similarly for the shadows, so you can see here, um, if I turn that off, the shadows are fine, but the clouds are slightly blown out. So in this case, I probably should have shot with a slightly different exposure, slightly darker, but it's not too bad. And you can still do a decent amount with this, but this is an example where um, potentially in RAW you can get slightly better uh, image quality in the sky. But yeah, I, th I think what, what I've, I'm quite happy with what I've done in the end with this JPEG image. So um, I just want to take you now through the, through the steps. Um, the first thing that I did on this image was to apply a preset. So I would always recommend using presets in Lightroom. They're very powerful. You can get a consistent look in your images that way and it can save down, save significant amounts of time uh, when you're post-processing because you get the same look um, and then just do some sort of minor adjustments locally um, or change the exposure a little bit, but you, you still get that consistent look and feel. So in this case, I, I used, um, so I have quite a few presets which are, are my own. I have a, what I've called a landscape, faded cloudy landscape uh, preset here. And if I just click on that, you see it already does a few different things. Um, so you can see the image has changed a bit. And if you look at the sliders here, there are already a few things changed. Uh, basically all of them in fact are changed. And so you can see here, it's actually changed the, the highlights. It's lowered, decreased the highlights, increased the shadows. And if you look at the histogram now, it, it looks a bit more balanced, 
like I said, you do have the, the blown out highlights here. You can see it's still, you can see this, this cloud is still very white. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's changed the, um, the colors a little bit. So because this is a JPEG, um, the white balance is, is just as shot. You can still shift this to make it more yellow, sort of warmer or cooler blues here. Um, occasionally I, I make minor adjustments there, but um, yeah, in this case, I've just left it as, as it is. Exposure is a little bit darker, just a 0.15 stop lower. I've added a bit of contrast, like I said, decrease the highlights and increase the shadows a bit. With the whites is a plus 14, minus 10 on the blacks. So this is all just the, the standard preset. I mean, you can apply a preset and then still change these, of course. Um, but I found actually in this image, it worked quite well with the just the basic preset settings here. Clarity is increased a bit and saturation is decreased. There's a tone curve here, so this is a slight contrasty tone curve, I would say. So you can see here, basically, it's increasing these, uh, sort of not the highlights, but the, the, the brighter tones here, and slightly decreasing the, the darker ones. Uh, then we've got the hue, saturation, and luminance. So saturation and luminance uh, bars, nothing has changed, but in the hue, there's some adjustments to the yellows and the greens. So the yellows are made slightly more orange and the greens are made slightly more yellow. Split toning is a, is a very powerful tool, I find. Um, you can really change your highlights and shadows, the colors in the, in the highlights and the shadows. So you can get a very different look. Uh, it's uh, quite, a, quite a powerful tool, like I say. Um, so you can change in the highlights, you can choose your color, and then you choose the saturation that you're applying to that color to, to the highlights. So in this case, I've got an orangey hue, which is applied to the highlights with a saturation of six, and in the shadows, I'm, I'm making them slightly bluer, so slightly cooler, and with a saturation of eight. Um, you can always see, you can al in Lightroom, you can always see what the effect of a certain change is with this toggle here. So you can turn it off and on, so here you can see it's actually quite a subtle effect, but you can see the shadows become a little bit cooler um, in, this, in this instance. Then in details, so I do sharpen the image and I apply some noise reduction. And then the lens correction, uh, I have these t uh, tick boxes here checked. So you've got remove chromatic aberration and enable profile correction. So that just adjusts the, and makes sure that the horizon is level and um, applies a, a bit of a, a lens correction based on the distortion of the lens. Then I've got a, a little bit of post-crop vignetting here applied, and that's it. So that's what the preset has done, nothing else. So the next step in the post-processing here, um, obviously the foreground is quite dark. So what I did was to use graduated filter. Now you can do this in a couple of different ways. You can use a radial filter, you can use a, a graduated filter, you can also use the adjustment brush. But in this case, the horizon is luckily quite flat. So I can apply a, a graduated filter like that. And so here I used a 0.7 exposure with shadows at zero. There we go. And so here you can see that I've just brought up the, the ground, the foreground to, to brighten it up a little bit. Um, so if you have, for example, mountains in the background, you might need to use the adjustment brush uh, or radio filter on those to get it looking natural. But in this case, because the horizon is nice and flat, I can just use the graduated filter and uh, it, it does, it brightens up the foreground nicely. The next thing I did was to use the spot removal tool. So you can see that the, the path in, in this area here, there's a bit of a muddy, muddy mess here. Um, in the fields, there are a few things which are, make it look a bit messy. And on the day that I was there, there was actually a film crew filming. Um, I don't know what they were filming, but they had a few guys on horses uh, going up and down the path here. Um, so they had all of their equipment. They had these tents that set up, like his catering equipment and so on. Um, so I wanted to get rid of those in the image as well. So I used the spot removal tool, um, which is here. Let, let's start maybe with the path and work our way left to right. So if I just go to this, so you can see, you can change the, the size of the of the brush here. Um, so I want quite a large brush size here. Um, and then I would basically just um, do this in several steps. Um, so the problem here I had was that the 
obviously the perspective changes a little bit. So as you move down the path, you're getting further away from the camera. And so it appears like the path is getting narrower when obviously it's not. Um, but if I were to copy, uh, so I'm using the, the spot edit heel option here. If I were to copy from further down the path and just take one long stretch, then it would end up looking a little, a little funny. I can show you that in an example here. So if I just do something like that, Lightroom automatically looks for the best fit when you apply the spot brush. And so it's found something up here, but you can see it just doesn't fit. It's too narrow actually for that position in the, in the, in the image. So I'm just going to delete that. So what I do instead is I just do, I apply this in stages. So you can see it's basically taking what it thinks is the best fit. And I just work my way down the path. That one has not gone where I wanted it to. There we go. Let's line up the edges a little bit. That looks okay. And then I say done. And uh, there's one here, which doesn't look quite right either. I'll just shift that again. Okay, of course that's obviously shifting everything downstream in the path as well. That's okay, and we can edit those. Not a problem. Okay, there we go, that's looking better already. Not perfect, but with a little bit more time I could, I could get that better. But now you see that sort of messy area in the path is, is gone, it looks more even all the way along the, the path there. Then there are a few sort of messy bits here in the field, which I don't like too much. It just, just distracts the attention a bit. So here I would use a much smaller brush size uh, and I would just basically tap on each one. So again, Lightroom is finding what it thinks is the best fit to heal the image in that location. And usually it's, it's pretty good. Um, so I'll just go through and tap all of these white things. I think they're little rocks or something. Um, this one is obviously a bit bigger. For that one, I would use a larger brush size. Here. I always find it's easier to do this when you're zoomed in, all of this sort of fine work here. Spot removal stuff. So there we go. Then we zoom back out. And there's still one thing here which distracts a bit. Done. So that's already looking much better. And one other thing that distracted me a little bit in this image is actually in the sky. You have this cloud up here, which is quite dark, it stands out a bit. Um, and so I would take that out as well. So let's just change, make this a bit bigger and get rid of this. There we go. All right, then we get to the slightly trickier bits. Um, so these tents here, they need to go. So again, um, back to the spot removal tool. And again, I would need quite a large brush size here. Um, so this one I will do in one long sweep like that. And it's suggesting that I use something down here. I'm actually going to shift that to, I always try and use, if, if I don't like what Lightroom suggests, I try and use the sort of a, an area right next to it um, if I can. So that looks, that looks okay. Um, you could probably do a bit more in Photoshop, but I mean, this is zoomed in and I'm not planning on printing this in a large format on my wall or anything. So if I zoom out again, that, that looks okay. I mean, you can't really tell. If you didn't know that that tent was there, you'd have no idea that that was edited there. So for the other one, we'll need a slightly larger brush size. Let's go with, let's try 75 maybe. How does that work? No, not quite 77. That's too big, so let's go in between 76. Yeah, that's looking better. So let's again just brush all of that. And for some reason, I think the tree is a good fit. I'm going to shift that down to here. And now we just try and get that to fit again. That's not looking that good, actually. Sometimes it's just trial and error here. You have to see what works and what doesn't work. So I could also try and do, like I did in the path, just do individual spots here. So I could 
gonna start with something like this. There we go. And then kind of fill that in. And here, so it's decided to try and take that area for some reason. Okay, I disagree. So I'm gonna shift that to there. And then zoom in and let's see if we can position that better. Okay, something like that. Again, it's it's not ideal. You can see there's a bit of it's a little bit disjointed here. I think in the, the previous edit that I did on this image, um, it was better. But uh, yeah, that's what that's what I say. It's um, try and error sometimes, and uh, sometimes you need a smaller brush, larger brush. Just try things out and see what works best for you. Okay, so um, that's uh, ah, one more thing I see here. There are two people in the courtyard, which I would also like to get rid of. So let's again use a smaller brush. Let's try 30 here and we can just, yeah, we can just brush them away. And now they're, they're not visible anymore. There we go. So that's, that's the spot removal work that I did on that image, just to clean it up a little bit. Um, I try and remove anything that distracts the viewer's attention away from the main subject. Um, and that, and especially in the foreground, you don't want anything you want the foreground to kind of lead the viewer's eyes to the subject. And if you've got something messy in the foreground, it just makes the viewer pause and look at it and it distracts from the image. So I do like to clean up the foreground in particular. Okay, then um, the next thing I used was a radio filter. So the radio filter is a very powerful tool. Um, you can do a lot with it. So you can add uh, in sort of dark areas, you can add some lightness into the shadows. In particular, in portraits, you can use a radio filter on the face just to um, brighten things up or on the eyes. Um, so it's very flexible. You can do a lot with it. In this case, I've used it in the sky because I wanted, I found the sky a bit boring here. Um, it's just a, it's a slightly overexposed sky, uh, which is a little bit boring. It doesn't have great clouds in it. Um, it's got no really nice colors or anything. So I just wanted to add a little bit, as if the sun was, was shining in here from the side um, a little bit. So I've applied, I've added a radial filter like this, quite a large one, um, which is just shining in through from the top right of the image onto the trees, onto the building. Now what I've done is because I wanted to have a look a little bit like sunlight, maybe sort of early morning or late afternoon, sort of golden look, I've changed the temperature of this actually. Um, so I've made it warmer. So let's shift this up to, ah, sorry, first I have to invert the mask because I don't want to apply it to the rest of the image. I want to apply it just to the area that I've got here. There we go. So I've made this warmer, um, something like that. Um, and then I've also increased the exposure. So let me just shift this up. I want to do a little bit less on the ground here, more in the sky. There we go. And I've increased this um, exposure here. There we go, something like that. So now it looks like you've got a little bit of sort of golden colored sunlight coming in from the top right corner of the image, just lighting the tops of the trees and the, and the roof of the castle. So it looks a bit more natural and uh, gives a little bit some more golden light to it, which I, which I like. Now, the last thing that I do on this uh, image, so what I like to do sometimes, I, I like to uh, sort of draw the, the, the viewer's image, uh, sorry, the viewer's eyes through the image. So I'm trying to use, in this case, the path as kind of a leading line to get the viewer to look up to the castle. Now, the field in front, I've cleaned it up a bit, but I also find it a little bit distracting here. I don't necessarily want to zoom in more, but I want to stop the viewer from sort of getting lost in the field, if you know what I mean. Um, so what I sometimes do is I use another graduated filter. Sometimes it can be the entire foreground or it can be just a corner just to, to darken it. So the, the darker uh, area will make the viewer then move on more quickly, I find. So here I've just used a graduated filter, which I apply in the corner, something like that. Um, so I start the graduated filter really at the corner so I don't get an area which is really 100% impacted by the changes I'm about to make. Um, it's really just graduated across the corner like that. And what I do here is usually I don't do anything other than just lower the shadows. Um, so something like a bit more, something like that. So that just darkens that corner a little bit, 
pushes the viewer's eyes more in the direction of the path, they catch the path, they follow it up and then across that sort of, across the moat and onto the castle where you've then got this nice golden light coming in from the graduated filter. And that's it, that's, that's all I've done, that's uh, the workflow I used for this image. So if you have any questions on any of that, any of the, the tools that I've used, just drop them in the comments below. I'll post this image on Instagram as well in a few minutes, so check out my Instagram account please. Uh, if you haven't already, click on the subscribe button here in the, in the corner um, to uh, make sure you catch any other videos I post in the future. And thanks for watching. Until next time.